have a piece of paper that tells everybody I am 100% pure-blooded Indian woman. I don't need no one coming in here taking what belongs to me. I've known a lot of folks that have been really, really criticized and put down in the community just for the way they look. Um, a friend of mine who's Shawnee, he's Eastern Shawnee, when he goes back out home and he goes into the tribal office, almost everybody there, blonde hair, blue eyes. Oh, I, I don't want to be interviewed on No, do it because it, it has to come from a lot of different looks and faces. Well, I, no, I can't. I can't. How come? I just, I can't. White skin, it's just, you know, over time we've just in, brought in these other genetics and I don't, I, to me it doesn't, I don't know how to explain it, but. And can I, let me just tell you a story of the realization of, of this craziness when we begin to separate each other. When we begin to say, well, you're only part Indian or you're this Indian or, well, you have this other blood running through your uh, blood veins, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so I was on an airplane about two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago. And I was way up in the sky and I looked out the window and you know, that's the best place to talk to God when you're 40,000 feet up in the sky. And you have, you have God's undivided attention. And one of the things that I always pray and talking is praying to God. You know, people they pray, so I talk. Anyway, I always look at the airplane, and there was about 90% um, of the people on the airplane are white people, Washingtons. And so across the aisle for me was a really handsome African American man with long legs, and he was just a nice human specimen. <laughs> and I, um, I looked at him and. I asked myself the question, what if I ever in my lifetime fell in love with an African American man? And would I, if I was younger, I'm 61 now, but when I was younger and I had eggs, would I have had an opportunity to procreate with this man to create a human being? And that human being would be Lakota, African American, and all the other blood that runs through my system. Well, in talking to God, I asked the question. I said, the God, I said, Creator God, I said, why did you make us all different colors? And Creator God said, you know, he said, you were thinking about that black man across from me. I said, yeah. He said, you know, he said, in this airplane, it's full of, uh, there's a lot of white women on this airplane of childbearing age. And this this man, black man's sperm can penetrate the egg of any one of these women on this plane, regardless of what color they are, and a human being will be created. So at the molecular level, the sperm and the egg have no color. They're transparent. And, and what the realization came to me that if the Creator did not want to, to procreate, they would, he would have, or she would have put some kind of chemical in my egg as an Indian woman that prevented fertilization to take place from the egg of a black man. I mean, the sperm of a black man. They would have put some kind of chemical in the egg of a white woman to prevent the sperm of any color man except the white man to penetrate that egg and create a human being. So I guess in, in think in, in talking to Creator about this, to me it's not about color, it's not about blood quantum. It's about how you self-identify. There are many Indians and I, you know, people talk about full blooded Indians, I you know it sounds like a dog or a donkey or a racehorse. <laughs> You know, if you're full blood, you're thoroughbred. You know, <laughs> so so the 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 um, the label that was put on us to determine how much Indian we we were or are was not of our doing. That was of the colonizers. That was of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. It's a way, and it was a way to control the people. 
control ourselves. And you know what's so sad is we bought into it like a sock and barrel. We bought into this definition of who we are by a group of white people. And, um, and hopefully, you know, kind of um, treat our community and, and kind of help with the process of healing. And um, so I encourage every community to do the same thing too. Identify those issues that are being detrimental to your community and try to take those steps and, and fixing them. Um, you know, we're also talking about tribal identity and um, I've seen many different people come in contact with many different people that are of mixed blood or um, are, you know, they go by like the, um, I guess, the uh, blood quantum system here, who's a quarter, who's this and who's that. And really, I really don't believe in that, I really don't have faith in that. Um, it's just something I think government's kind of thrown on us to, to kind of um, weed us out to kind of um, water down the blood, basically, and um, I'm not in favor of it. Um, I definitely see a lot of different people I come in contact who are very, very proud of their heritage and who they come from and their ancestors. And I think it's important for us as Indian people to, to gather together. You know, we have strength in numbers. And I would like to encourage that um, strength in numbers, that whole idea, the whole concept. Every Indian tribe has their way of identifying who is a member. And we, and, and in Pine, my colleagues and I, we don't, we want to remove the word tribal member, we want to say tribal citizen, citizen, so we're citizens. And, and so we've been saying this and now we're finding where people are saying I'm a Lakota citizen from Pine Ridge. <laughs> I'm an Oglala citizen. And, and but you know, it, every, every, every nation has their way of determining who can be a citizen of their nation. And we have the, it's a very emotional battle. Because here again, so you've got people who've been brainwashed into thinking the blood quantum issue, and, and, and other people can determine if you are or you aren't a citizen of that nation. And that to me is, 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 is part of that long uh, history of being colonized and of having other people define for us how to be, who to be, where to be, and why to be. So what's, what's exciting about this generation, I, I just turned 61 a couple of weeks ago, and, but in that journey I've been on, is I've been able to take a look at things, listen, understand, weigh, and try to make sense of why where we are today. And, 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 and part of our relationship with each other, with my colleagues and friends, is constantly calling on each other's behaviors of colonized thinking and colonized behavior and colonized sayings. Because it gets, we get ingrained with these thoughts and ideas that are handed on from one generation to the other. This generation is breaking that paradigm of colonized thinking. Do you, do you think there needs to be a, a, a seat at the table, like a representation, at least one seat in tribal councils for those kids growing up in the communities that aren't enrolled? Or I think so. Um, yeah, I do, actually. Yeah, I do. I, I'm, I'm half white. And so when I would go back to my community, when I was very young, I felt like there really needed to be someone there to embrace me for being half white. And, you know, understanding that my identity was very complicated and I wasn't able to just go to the res and hang out with my cousins and everybody just embraced me. It was kind of, you know, haha, that little half white girl. <laughs> and look at her, oh, she talks funny, she's from the city and all this kind of stuff. But. Um, over time, over a lot of time, it's changing, finally. They're, they're more apt to, to, you know, I come visit and then they go, wow, you're doing all this, you do that, you do this, and they really go, wow, you really are one of us, you know? <laughs> it's not just this thing that they, they assumed something just because of where I came from and part of who I was, but over time, I think that they've done that with a lot of the kids out there who are not full you know, really embracing them and saying, oh, you still are our people. We just didn't understand <laughs> for a long time. Thanks. But it took a good 20 years. <laughs> what would you think about uh, if people that are inside and on the, in the tribal councils, what, do you th what would you think about them having a, a seat at large for members of their community that are not necessarily of uh, that much as first blood, but they still remember the community? Maybe they might be enrolled in standing room, but they're living in the community because they're living in the community, maybe they can have a voice with just one seat. I think that's a pretty fine line. Um, like I mentioned earlier about um, about the different types of recognition, um, 
that's been the will of some of our people to recognize other plateau tribes, other Columbia River, River tribal blood. Um, I think that it would be a benefit. Maybe, you know, it would be a start to have, have that seat and maybe not be a, a, a voting member, but still be able to sit at the table. We have so many of our tribal members that uh, are a mix of so many Indian blood that they're not able to be enrolled in any one tribe. And that's devastating because they're, they're not... Um, they're not incorporated as a, an enrolled tribal member in any tribe, but they're just as much Indian as, as anybody else, as, as myself or as, as you know, even my grandfathers. Being Indian isn't maybe even necessarily being affiliated with a tribe per se. It's who you are as a person. Um, you know, I know, you know, growing up, you know, I'm, I'm part of the Bishop Paiute tribe and uh, my family is uh, Miwok. Um, and Washoe, Washoe Indian from Nevada, and uh, I also have some Irish blood and, and Spanish blood. But I think a lot of it just depends on the person who you are, um, your integrity, your character. Um, and as Indian people, I, I think we are pretty thankful and, and grateful people, and for the most part, are pretty honest people. And uh, I think uh, those are the things that we hold to that are more valuable than uh, maybe being a tribal member. We have to know who we are. And, 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 and that made my heart hurt sometimes because we have so many of our citizens who've been adopted out, grew up in families, uh, totally removed from who we are, don't know anything, and they're, they're on this journey to find who they are, okay? So, I, you know, it, it breaks my heart that we have, and I call them throwaway human beings, for lack of a better term. They fall between the cracks. And who are we to set ourselves to be the judge of determining if they're, of, they can be a citizen of my nation or not, you know? So, so, so it's a very emotional discussion. It's a very uh, painful discussion at times in our tribal community. Well, in Canada, we have what we call Bill C-31, where prior to Bill C-31, any Indian woman who married outside a non-native man, they lost their treaty status. And that and it was only in 1981 when Bill C-31 was, was reinstated in Canada where now these Indian women who married out a non-Indian man, now they've gotten back their status. And so they have treaty status in Canada now. And that so, and I am a product of Bill C-31 in the sense where my mom married, my, my father was Métis. And she lost her treaty status, so when Bill C. Thurman came back in, I was able to get my, regain my treaty status. Which I found in the sense, like, well, who are these people to tell me who is Indian, who isn't Indian? And that especially in Canada, a government who doesn't even understand or respect us for who we are. So that's kind of where, for me, so Indian identity is, it's a state of mind. And that, and by, and I see a lot of people who are now becoming instant Indians because now it's cool to be an Indian nowadays. And that, so we have these people coming out of the woodwork saying, well, I'm Indian, I'm one part Cherokee or what. I've been meeting a lot of people here at the conference who've been saying, and these guys look, uh, but all of a sudden now there's, they're one eight this or one eight that. And that, and it's just, and they want to be in it, which is cool. And that, uh, but you know what, when, if you're going to fly that flag, Make sure you understand who you are, where you come from, your history, your language, and understand that. So it's more than looking like an in, it, it comes from within. So, so that's what I'm saying with, uh, for me, Indian identity. Kiro <laughs> 
ni hiyo